How's everybody doing? Awesome. Awesome. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, welcome to the, uh, you know, the, the pandemic and everything. I'm forgetting what year it is. Uh, this is Invention Boot Camp 2022. <laughs> yeah, and we're here at the finale. Uh, so, yeah, another round of applause, another round of applause. So, for the past four weeks, our inventors and mentors have been working hard learning about inventing and design and human-centered design and looking for problems and not focusing on the solution right away but thinking about what is a problem that I can solve? And what you will see in a moment are the problems that our inventors chose to solve and how they went about doing it. Uh, I, I think, <laughs> I don't know what else to say. It's been great and um, I'm gonna <laughs> bring Jim Hook up, uh, along. He has something to say too. Yeah. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Massey College of Engineering and Computer Science. I'm Jim Hook. I'm a professor of computer science and I'm associate dean of the college here. Uh, and I'm, I've really had the joy of watching Invention Boot Camp over the years. Invention Boot Camp has been supported continuously by the Limelson Foundation. The Limelson Foundation believes that invention is, is a mechanism that can be used to to build healthier communities and, and, and help people get a certain kind of empowerment. And I think you're going to see that in action today as you see all of the amazing things that the inventors have done. I'm really, really excited to work with Jerry and Mike and all of the mentors. And I want to thank all the parents and the good stuff's going to come. I'll talk more at the end. Go inventors. Yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, who's ready to see some inventions? Uh, doesn't I don't think I don't think they're really ready. I don't think they're really ready. I heard more clapping during week 1 of camp. <laughs> uh, so who's ready to see some inventions? There we go. <laughs> Let's give it up for Anna and Aiden with Sign Script. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Invention Boot Camp finale. I'm Aiden. And I'm Anna, and our project is Sign Script. So, Sign Script is our hand mounted device that goes over a glove and you can use it to translate sign language symbols from the signs by the wear into text on the screen on the front. When working towards coming up with an idea, I knew that I wanted to make something I knew that I wanted to make something that would solve a healthcare related problem and Aiden wanted to make something cool, so we decided to collaborate. <laughs> and for my personal background, I took a nursing assistant course in the spring and I learned a lot about the different um, communication disparities in healthcare. And one of the major ones that was emphasized is specifically in the auditory impaired community. And an important statistic that I wanted to share with everyone is that for every 220 hearing impaired people, only one person can communicate with them in sign language. So that was very impactful for the two of us. And when we saw the mentors explaining how these flex sensors work, we thought it would work for a sign language translator because for each flexion and extension, it puts out a certain value. And that's how sign language works. So we thought to pursue a sign language translator. It, in practice, it wasn't really that easy, though. <laughs> for, st <laughs> for starters, um, the flex sensors work by sensing how far you bend your fingers. So that makes certain letters in sign language, like J, and Z, which require moving your hands, impossible to do without something to check the acceleration of your hand. Furthermore, coding is hard. 
<laughs> There's a lot, a, lo a lot of trial and error went into creating the final code that is unfortunately not running right now because their battery ran out. <laughs> but, um, yeah, the, the code ended up not working in the end because the wires shorted out a little bit, but everything is in place. If we had the values, it would work perfectly. <laughs> so our takeaways from this are, you may have, if you have a simple idea, it might be a little bit more difficult to do an execution. <laughs> and yeah, we had a great time designing SignScript. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and so that's SignScript. Thank you, everyone. Any questions? <laughs> questions. Any questions? Oh. How much? <laughs> uh, d as to be as determined. <laughs> what were all the else if statements trying to do? So a lot of else if statements. It, what? On your slide. Oh, right on the slide, yeah. So uh, each of these else if statements, so each of these corresponds to a letter. So if, the, if it would give us our values back for, for reliably, this is where we would put the value that the sign script, that the sign script um, flex sensors give us, and that would return a letter on, printed on the OLED screen. So the if-else statements are just because there are 26 letters of the alphabet. Technically 24 because of, of the aforementioned no J or Z. Were you able to get it to print full words, or would it be like one letter at a time? One letter at a time. Because most words in sign language involve like Two hands. gestures and multiple hands. It would re require a bit more work. Somebody's, somebody's seat is broken. <laughs> <laughs> to get a little bit more time, what do you think you would change or improve? We would definitely spend more time calibrating the flex sensors, and we would probably, instead of getting a, an exact value from a wide range of numbers, we would just do on or off. So we could at least get a few letters of the alphabet. And we would definitely make sure that all the connections work before putting the whole thing together. <laughs> yeah. Ah, yeah, there's a whole no story idea there. How many times we had to stitch this thing? Mm -hmm. oh, wait. Do we have a question in the chat? I think we can take one more question. That question? No, it wasn't a chat. Okay. Right. Anything else? Yep. All right. Is it different for left and right handed? Uh, we could make left and right handed models, but we have just a right handed model because both of us are like right handed for now. And I saw one more. Do you foresee doing a left and a right to be able to do your words? Definitely. Okay. And adding an accelerometer. That's just something that measures the acceleration of your hand. So it can track when you're moving your hand to do some of the values of movements, numbers, letters, et cetera. All right. Thank you. Thank you. OK, and next up we have the panic patch. Uh, so come on up. We got Jose. Davin and Tony. Let's give them a round of applause. Oh yeah, see where, see where the X is right there? Boom, that's your spot to speak. And when you want Alex to advance the slide, just say next slide. Introducing the Panic Patch by Tony, Davin, and Jose. Our Davin's initial goal when he was founding this was he wanted that something was health related, health related. He also wanted a solution to his anxiety and stress. So it had to be a device that calm, that responds to sharp increases in heart rates and anxiety attacks to calm the user down. Did you? Uh, okay, so as you can see, our final version ended up being a sleeve for the wrist. And there were three main components to it. There was the circuit playground, which involved the lights for calming you down. Um, there is the pulse sensor, which was used for the BPM. And then there was the OLED, which was basically the screen that shows the BPM. So um, mainly our design, as we reiterated, um, 
is, were from the constraints of the pull sensor because it was really finicky. So we just shaped our design around it. And moving on to how the pull sensor works, why it's finicky is because it's using a light sensor. So it shoots out a green light into your finger. And then based on um, the color of your blood, like how red it is, it absorbs a certain amount of that light and then some of it returns back and then the light sensor picks that value up. And through there we can determine like the beats per minute for, with like our own code. So if we had more time, we would definitely like add like more of a sound system, like a uh, calming music to help the user calm down. Um, getting the pulse sensor to work in more convenient areas because I know um, it was it worked best on the finger, but like the best place it actually would be that would be most convenient would be like the wrist or something, and then. Uh, making the wiring more neater because we had like a lot of wires. Uh, that picture is was in testing and you cut it down by a lot, but it still has some that were like that sticks out. Anyways, uh, moving on. Demonstration. Yeah it would work if the battery didn't keep dying, but <laughs> on this tip over here is a huh? Yeah it happened before. On the tip over here there's the light sensor or the uh, pulse sensor that you know like green light that um, detects the hemoglobin in your uh, blood. And then if the heartbeat were to go high, the light, the neopixels would flash in like a certain way that you have to breathe in with it. And along with the lights, the, there would be a speaker noise that will go beep. That's it. <laughs> So do you want them to ask questions or? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have any questions? Yeah, sure, Oliver. How much does ambient light affect the A sensor? Lot. A lot. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then black out the, the side of it, because all the light just goes right through it. And we have a question over here. Oh yeah, we did. Actually, we tested it on someone with a dark skin tone, and then like like before we were trying the wrist, and then it barely worked. But then we tested on someone with darker skin, and then it, it read nothing at all. So that was like quite a problem. Yeah, but there's an article out of Johns Hopkins showing that if you have melatonin in darker concentrations, those things are enormously inaccurate. Oh, we have another question? Uh, it was definitely the code for like getting the piece per minute. We had like Jerry help us out like a lot, so big thanks to him. Uh, yeah, that was pretty much it. And then getting the full sensor to work properly at first. Yeah. I see your LED is, is green on the diagram. Does it necessarily need to be green and why? Uh, I'm pretty sure it was because uh, green light absorbs, for some reason, it's what I read on like an article, but um, green light absorbs more on like red blood cells, I heard. Opposites on the color Because they're opposites in the color of the lights. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> and it looks like Kira has a question. Uh, can we hear that? Could you uh, oh, sure. Uh, what inspired you guys to have the flashing light at a certain pace with, combined with the breathing to be what calms the user down? Oh, so that was uh, originally inspired actually by the Apple Watch because there was like something that there was a function that would tell you to breathe every once in a while. So I was like, how could I make that? But like, <laughs> with like.
light, just lights. So I'm like, flashing lights would be like maybe a really simple idea to include. Cool. Right on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And uh, next up is the uh, the team that loves oatmeal cookie, oatmeal raisin cookies the most. Uh, <laughs> we have TJT. I made that part up, or did I? Uh, TJT. Uh, they have the. Uh, it's just TJT. Uh, <laughs> Tell us about your, your, your product, Woo. your invention. Hi, um, so we are the TJT group. Um, today we're going to be presenting our amazing invention. Um, my name is Durga. Uh, I'm Peniel. I'm Gautam. And I'm Angie. Oh, great. Okay. Um, so this year's theme was wearable technology. And some of the skills that we learned from this camp that we had to incorporate into our invention were using a Circuit Playground Express or a CPX, um, working with sensors and wiring, coding in C++, and the engineering design process. Um, our problem for our person, Timmy, was that he was <laughs> frequently in the hospital. And he didn't really like wearing his you know, hospital robe. So he wanted to look cool, but at the same time be functional. So our solution for Timmy in the hospital was we created a heartbeat sensor that tracked his heartbeat and a temperature sensor. So basically, the heartbeat sensor was on the thumb and then the temperature sensor, the thermistor, was on the hand and then the wires just went up, um, just went up and was covered by a sleeve and the CPX rested on your shirt. Um, so our materials. Um, so the black sleeve covered the wires which led to the CPX and the CPX was covered in white felt and was sewn into a heart shape, as you can see here. And the thread was used to sew the white felt. Um, and because um, the felt might block some of the color, we stuffed it with polyester. And then we used the safety pins to pin it onto the clothing. And as I said, the heart sensor um, is on the thumb with Velcro, along with the hand, I mean, the, the mister on the hand. Alright, so during our design process, we had to make a lot of changes. First of all, like for the wiring, it was really messy, and we initially had the idea to use Velcro straps to keep them in place. However, it was really chunky and it was unorganized. So, we, as you can see, we made a sleeve to keep it more like intact and like hidden. And another change that we made is that instead of embedding the LEDs into a shirt, which is our original idea, we made them into a pin. So we can move it around; it would be more customizable. And lastly, we noticed that the wrist does not track your heartbeat as accurately, so we moved the heart sensor from the wrist to the thumb. And some, for some finishing touches, we added some cute patches for fashion, and we also adjusted the fabric to make it more comfortable for the user. Alright, so um, here's our final design right now. So as you can see, I've got the heart sensor right here, like the previous group mentioned. Um, we also found that um, it's best, it be measures your heart pulse best on your finger, not your wrist. So um, we originally had it on our wrist, but we moved it up to our finger. So the, um, the wiring, it goes up all the way up the sleeve and into the heart pin right here. And we also have the thermistor, which is the temperature sensor that um, also goes up the sleeve. And um, typically the thermistor, we would put that in with the, the, um, with the heart sensor, but we have it out for just the demo right now. So if we, let's say, um, rub the thermistor to make it warmer. It changes color, and it'll probably cool down in a few seconds now. Um, and next slide. So before we get famous with our idea and mass produce it, <laughs> we would probably get better equipment, because um, surprisingly it's working right now, but if you don't have it on tight enough, or if you move your hand around too much, it doesn't work as well. And it we would also like to make it more comfortable so that the wires, are, we don't feel the wires going up the sleeve. And maybe even try to make it like portable so that um, we could just transmit your whole heart pulse to the pin. And we would also file a patent so no one steals our idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess we could answer questions right now or you could come find us at the demo after the presentations. Thank you. All right.
Okay. So, oh, they have questions. They have questions. Where did you get those cute patches? I'm not smelling. Um, <laughs> um, yes, uh, um, at Joanne's. Yes. Yeah, Joanne's. Um, I'll How does your heartbeat sensor work? Um, it is the exact same one. <laughs> so, so, so then how much does ambient light affect yours? Uh, we didn't look too much into that. Yeah. We just were very focused on making sure that it worked. <laughs> but I'd say about the same, so it's the exact same thing. Okay. Yeah, and Do you have a question? Yeah. So you said that the pin that's currently a heart can be made into different things for different kids. Did you have ideas about other designs that you would use? Um, we had different ways about making the heart. Okay. Um, I'm sure if we like really wanted to, I guess we could always make it into like a star or like a square if someone likes squares. But, um, you can make one into an oatmeal raisin cookie. What is HAT? Oh. Yes. Um, okay, so we were kind of just messing around in the beginning with our ideas, and so from the picture that we saw all the way up at the front, um, that we named our kid Timmy, and we named him Timmy Jr. the third, and that's just his initials. <laughs> Oh yeah, it says right there, yeah, cool. All right, and if you have more questions uh, after the presentations, uh, all of the projects will be out in the atrium lobby so that you can interact with each invention like one-on-one -on -one and ask more questions. Cool, so let's, let's give another round of applause for TJT. And uh, bef before this one, I need everyone to make their best bird sound in three, two, one. Squaw! <laughs> Our next group is Oliver and Scarlett with the Spectrum. <laughs> Team Spectrum. Team. Yeah. The Evoke Watch. Uh, by the Spectrum, including. I am Scarlett Davis and Oliver Young. And so, in the boot camp, we were taught a lot about, honestly, more about idea development than anything else. And the boot camp taught us the human-centered design process, in which you start by talking to people and f deeply understanding your problem before coming up with a solution. And we practiced this by going around and interviewing various people until we came up with our idea. The problem we wanted to make a solution for was forgetfulness. We're all capable of forgetting things. Whether it be taking your meditation before you go to bed, walking the dog, stuff like that. So, then we decided to make a solution. Following this year's theme, which was wearable technology, we created a little watch, uh, which yeah. Oliver is wearing right here, uh, in which you input a time and a message of your liking, and then when it reaches that time, it will beep, flash your message, reminding you of the thing that you need to do. Here are some pictures for your viewing pleasure of the process. Uh, there's a painstaking coating. Oh, I... <laughs> <laughs> okay, multiple times, my coat ran perfectly fine, and then the next day, I changed not any coat didn't work. Yeah. Uh, there's an external button that we tried to wire to a breadboard, but then... Oh. <laughs> it turned uh, out that the breadboard was kind of clunky, so then we just ended up soldering it straight to the circuit board, uh, or Oliver did at least. Um, and then we had to make the actual shell for it, which is this bulky brick that he's wearing. <laughs> and that led us to the final product, uh, this clunky thing. It is a brick and I love it. Uh, <laughs> you're about to drink your water. Uh, any questions? You. <laughs> <laughs> Are we clapping for the question or clapping for the uh, <laughs> You with the sunglasses. Can it play Tetris? No. No. Also, you with the hat. Oh, what? Nothing. Nope, nothing. Okay. Uh, how, how do you input what the, what the um, message is? Like, well, how does drink water right there? Do you need to code for it? Uh, well, ideally, we would type it in, but we didn't get that far. So, and yeah, getting up there would take weeks, but luckily, our code is actually relatively user-friendly. You literally just 
You make an alarm and screen. then set the time and then just write the message and it's there is your message. You set two values and time and message. Simple. Yeah, you set two values and then write it, write a thing. Anyone else? Uh, you in the back? Uh, what does the button do? The button? Okay, so it starts beeping, right? Uh, the button is to make it shut up or else it will beep forever. <laughs> <laughs> Alex had a question. Oh, you. Did, did you need a certain external device to get that clock working? Yes. yes. Uh, we were provided very graciously uh, with a free uh, real clock. time clock. Yes, by the same people that made the circuit board. Uh, speaking of the circuit board, if we were to change anything, it would be the circuit board. There's a lot of devices on there that we don't need, like uh, lights and various sensors, which at, which is largely why it's bulky. Um, so we find something far simpler, and uh, also not make it out of uh, phone board. Okay. Uh, you? So I know one of the other groups was talking about deaf people. So what if you guys kind of collaborated and had like a separate way of notifying people who, like a reminder? It'll vibrate. Vibrate? Oh, is there a vibration sensor? No. We can make one. Funny <laughs> story. I was almost in their group at the start. <laughs> <laughs> We will make the speaker so loud that it vibrates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> and next is transportation. Uh, uh, TLS. All right, yeah, next up, uh, or, or, oh, there you are. We have uh, Essie and Ezra with the transportation light signal. Come on up. All right, we got a... <laughs> I thought you were going to ride the bike in here. <laughs> oh, we have some background music. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Essay. And my name is Ezra. And we are the... TLS or Light Transportation System. Okay. Um, by, um, sorry. Uh, so, uh, here's the problem. So, when people ride bike on the road, they have um, problems, communication to other drivers, and uh, yeah, overall, just the environment of a road it can be very busy, and so, uh, it's just that cyclists have very hard time riding bikes with all uh, the communication. So we thought it was uh, it was a good idea to build something that can help them communicate better. Um, so our initial goals were to uh, improve the safety of bicyclists and pedestrians alike, as well as making an invention that we could be proud of. Um, Okay, so our final uh, version is a bike that has a, a flex sensor uh, which you can uh, bend. And this uh, light show, there, there's LED, just light. And so usually how this happens is when you're riding bike, you want to turn left, you would bend. Uh, so let's say you want to turn uh, right now. <laughs> Um, and so things we learned um, throughout this whole process were some very useful skills. 
so you can probably use in the future, like um, soldering, coding, and designing in general, as well as time management, which is a big thing. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so some improvement we would make is that if you look very closely at this side, it's a uh, cardboard, and so we would want that to be like some kind of plastic to go along with rains and different weathers. And also we would improve this wire around here. Uh, it's kind of messy as you can see, and so uh, something that just good and less wiry and yeah, good looking too. And um, improve our code. Yeah, that's just something we would improve overall. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, good job, good job, good job. Are there any questions? Oh, yeah, there are questions. Why did you choose a flex sensor over a button? Um, we thought that it would be easier as well as instead of having two different buttons, we just have one flex sensor. So while you were coming up with the LED thing, I happened to be working outside near you, and I heard the mentors recommend that you don't do the arrows. Why did you end up doing the arrows? Um, yeah, so our original idea was that uh, just to put a bunch of uh, <laughs> LED, and so create something, uh, it's just a long story, but anyways, less, we just used less uh, LED. Uh, just an arrow, and they say it's easier, so we just uh, stuck with that. I think uh, a question yeah. right here. How resilient are the flex sensors? Like if you're constantly bending it one way, and then up, and then back, and then the other, are they going to break eventually, or is it are they built pretty tough? Um, I would say they're built pretty tough. We've um, done a lot of testing while we um, made the team has sent it probably over a hundred times by now. And it hasn't shown anywhere in the uh, Are any of you two interested in like actually using this? Because, I mean, my dad likes a lot of this. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm a big fan of cycling. And I, ever since I was a child, child I, I just ride bikes. So I would definitely use this. Uh, I think I would use this, but I don't have my score to use one by one and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, person in the back. Oh. Sorry. Oh. How would you guys improve your device? Improve our device? Weather weatherproof. Like, like water oh, kicking oh, oh. like snow. Okay. Oh, as you can see, there's a paper and a cardboard, and that's not <laughs> good with rain. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just make it plastic or um, anything that's hard and it's friendly with what rain and hot. So, yeah. awesome. Yeah. Have you actually like looked at it outside in the sun? Like, is it is it visible? And is orange really the best color for that? Because the sun is like orangish red. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. So what I did was I took one pixel and I went outside. There was a window and you can see like the sunshine. And so it was very bright. Yeah. I assume it works outside too. Did you ever consider putting the lights on like the back of the helmet or something? Uh, I think we did at one point. Right? Yeah, it was kind of wiry, just going all over the. Uh, it's yeah. not good when you're cycling, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, Wait, just just one last thing. But how how are you how are you planning to like, keep it powered, for example? you want to have like a battery that's replaceable or maybe use pedaling or generative braking or something like that? Um, right now there is a battery here at the front of the circuit board, um, which is, I guess, kind of replaceable, but I'm sure that there are better options in the future. Cool. All right. Let's give them another round of applause. Uh, you, you can put that thing in the bike garage. Uh, as, no, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm pretty sure a pedal palooza ride leader would love to have that. Yes. yes. <laughs> All right, and uh, our next team, uh, they're going to make you do some exercise. Armstrong. Yeah, they're going to make you do some exercise. We got Team Armstrong. Come up, come up. <laughs> Yeah.
Yeah. Hello, as you heard, we're Team Armstrong. My name is Luis. This is Amamanti, Zephyr, and Izaka. Uh, this is the product we've made. It's just a quick show before we start. Okay. So, one often overlooked, but, but somewhat, or not somewhat, extremely important, um, extremely important problem in the gym is the require, or is that people are required to essentially multitask on, on multiple different miscellaneous, miscellaneous things. So, um, recognizing this problem, our team has devised a solution, which is an exercise tracker. Right? So, our initial design goals were to make a wearable device that used a flex sensor to measure the movement of the device on your arm. And we also wanted to have visual and audible reminders for whenever you complete a motion. And so, some of the setbacks that we encountered were the first sensor that we used wasn't as accurate as we thought it would be. And um, it was also, there was a lot of bugs inside of the code for the speaker and the lights. Okay, uh, so to fix these problems, uh, we did like a lot of code debugging, as well as we switched from our original sensor, which was like more attention based, to one more based on like your actual motion. And then we used a compression sleeve to actually house the device. Um, so that's where our final uh, product comes in. Uh, it's a device that will measure your reps and it will uh, display how many you've done and how many you have left on a little screen, as well as give you visual and audible reminders via lights and speaker when you have completed a rep or a set. The benefits to using our device would be you would keep uh, better track and focus of your actual set instead of losing, because uh, me personally, I go to the gym almost every day of the week, and I find it really hard to keep track of how many are smooth for each set. So this would uh, help you, uh, it'll remind you, okay, you've done, let's say you're doing four reps per set, so you'll do one, two, three, four, and then it'll remind you, and then it'll say, okay, you're done with your set. And then if you don't use it, well, obviously you're not gonna have that focus, and it's gonna be much harder to um, have that intense intensity and uh, fun in the workout. And and well, um, I'm going to demonstrate now how this works. <laughs> well, um, it's a really a replaceable battery, just an ion battery that you just plug into the circuit board. And this would be the OLED. Uh, as you can see right now, it beeped. Well, it wasn't plugged in. But it beeped because it sensed movement. And that kind of does it as a rep. But when you're just Lay position, you're not doing red, nothing, it's red. So when you lift it up, it'll turn blue. So, and uh, as you can hear the sound, it's one rep. If you do it halfway, which is not a complete rep, it won't do nothing at all. So you have to use full range, <laughs> you have to use full range of motion for it to count. So that's something that's pretty cool. You can't be lazy about it. <laughs> um, I guess I'll have to reset it. But uh, usually, uh, okay, it didn't turn on. But right here, as you can see on the screen, I, I don't know, the people at the front, it's really small. <laughs> <laughs> it says, at the top, it says rep goal. Then it says um, reps completed and reps remaining. So it'll remind you of those three main things. Um, well, that's really it. Uh, oh, yeah, and you can use it for, right now that we've tested it, that fully works. You can do curls, push-ups, squats, um, and oh, what was bench press. Um, any questions? Uh, there's a lot of questions out there. <laughs> uh, Where are the flex sensors? Are you not using we're not using flex sensors. What are you using that to? That's still an armor. Yeah. That sounds really cool. Would you actually use this? Uh, me personally, yes. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, how did you come up with your name? Um, <laughs> well, uh, 
I don't know. We just thought of it, really. <laughs> <laughs> there was no process behind it. It's called it? arm strong because it makes your arms strong. <laughs> <laughs> Is Zako with the save? Yeah. <laughs> uh, two things. So one, is there any way right now to input a number of reps, like with a button or something? Yes, I forgot. To say. Thank you for saying. Yeah. Okay. So there's two buttons: the uh, left and right button. The right button increases the reps, and the left button decreases them. So if, for uh, say, you press the button too many times, you can just delete that rep. And then you just start doing the reps, and it'll uh, uh, just work. And then two, if you said it uses accelerometer, how does it do a push-up? A push-up. It's the same thing. Since it's uh, basically the same thing as doing a curl, it's still going up and down. You just have to put it on a different part of the body. So for the push-up, it'd go on your uh, tricep right here. And then the same thing for your like squats, it'd go under your calf. And then for your um, Bench press, yeah, it go on your arm right here. And you uh, the, did you, did you show us? Sorry, when you get to the, when you complete your set. Oh yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, Before really that question. Complete the set, but it would you just do one, and then if you reach your set, how many did it put? Oh, I did four. Okay, so I need. Yeah, see, it didn't work because I didn't do the full range of motion. So, oh, I'm pretty negative. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my fault. Yeah, that's one thing. If you do negative, it will just keep on going and it will never reach. And never <laughs> but here, it's one, two, and then it's left to green. You're Yay. Seven. We have one more question. What happens if you get super sweaty? <laughs> well, it's um, it should it affect it because it's on a compression, uh, compression sleeve. So I like, sort of the sweat. I um, I use these a lot, and they soaks it up really good. Plus, it's on, mounted on a three D bracket, which is plastic. Just the uh, <laughs> sweat should just rub off easily. Awesome. awesome. I think uh, we have or uh, one more question. Um, if you have more time, would you incorporate a way for people who are exercising to read their uh, blood pressure, heart rate, stuff like that, other things that people might need to know? Oh, yeah, maybe, most likely, yeah. Uh. Cool. Any other questions? All right, let's give them another round of applause. <laughs> and um, our next team wouldn't tell me what their product does. They said... It was a trade secret, <laughs> and now I kind of regret doing that whole lesson on intellectual property. But I'm also proud. I'm proud. Uh, so we have Riffs Rave. Flashable style will be noticed with some flashing lights. Uh, I'm Will. I'm Connor. And I'm Nick. All right. So <laughs> originally we were thinking about you know what problems we could solve, you know lack of visibility in the night. But eventually we stumbled across a problem that we could get behind. Right now I'm in some bland gray clothing, not nearly as stylish as Connor over here. <laughs> And uh, we had to solve that, so we came up with the wrist rave. The product. When we first came up with our product, we had some different product ideas. For example, the shake responsive hat that would light up as you turned around or did things with your head. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that would have been hard to make for one, and it just didn't seem that useful or a glove belt, though glove as you do belt things like walking around. <laughs> but we didn't have access to, to enough external LEDs for that to be viable. Or an LED clock watch that would function just like a normal clock watch. But those already exist. So. <laughs> so for our process, uh, we had started with a uh, notebook of ideas. 
And we said, okay, we want to do this, we want to do that, how can we combine them all to get what we want? And we then broke it up into uh, our areas of expertise. So I took on the CAD, Will did the code in uh, C++ and Arduino, uh, and Connor did the, uh, the wiring as well as the sewing of the, the watch paper. So here you can see some pictures from the process. In the top left, there's the early version of the wrist rave before it got the, uh, the watch straps, and then also before it got some rigidity fixes. Uh, down at the bottom left, there were some measurements for um, key parts that we had to include in the CAD to make sure that it all fit properly to the user. Uh, and then in the middle and right side, you see um, Will working on the code, and then uh, Connor working on the prototype watch band. So our product, the wrist rave, is comprised of three main components. <laughs> A 3D printed case. <laughs> a 3D printed case that encloses the CPX, which is the main brains of the operation. Um, a wristband that's made out of fabric and has sewn in individual LEDs to make the wristband even better. And then a bunch of software and code that does the entire thing. <laughs> so some issues we came across were some non-conductive thread that kept shorting out on itself, not working. Not that bad, not that good. So, and then in our first iteration of the tray, some screw holes, we forgot to make it go all the way through. The battery tray, kind of funky. The first one's not the best, I know from experience. Uh, <laughs> code, it's, code's funky sometimes. You gotta work on it. All right, so again, just code issues. Organization in general is very helpful, but when you're staring at a big noodle mess of code for two hours and not knowing what's going on, it's very helpful to reorganize your code and make sure you understand what you're doing. Uh, also, don't take shortcuts while you sew, because that cost us many days, because the wires kept touching and breaking themselves. So do it by, your, do it by hand and do it right. Aw, Laura will be real sad. Something else that all the mentors taught us was we have to uh, iterate quickly. So during multiple challenges during the camp, we built a couple of things where they said, build something as fast as possible and then find what doesn't work and then iterate on that. So we made, in, in the end, I believe, three versions and designed for four uh, to find what really works best. thing right now, where one, you have this thing that travels around as a circle, one where it just cycles through red to green, green to blue, blue to red, in a loop, and lastly one where it goes on, travels around, and goes off. Mm -hmm. And the, aside from this one where it just follows the same red, green, blue pattern, uh, all of the things switch whenever the cycle resets. Cool. Uh, what's one process or tool you use to implement and uh, organize the code? To, to organize the code? Um, well, first of all, one thing I did was I rewrote it. I, I'm not sure if that's the best way to do it. <laughs> but whenever I come across a problem and I just didn't know what was going on, I take it and start it from the beginning and try to make it as succinct as I could. Um, getting it into like one, you know, getting a function that had maybe was four or five lines before into like as few as possible so I could understand what was going on is my process. Would it be possible to add like a clock or a heart rate sensor or something so that Aside from just being fashionable, it's responding to some type Flashable. of uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so input that is then, you know, maybe not displaying to everyone, but you know what the different flashing means. Oh, okay. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Who was the graphic designer? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys still thinking about syncing up your other? 
Uh, yeah, that is a, another possibility of using it, make it all at the same time. Uh, which one of your parents invented light up sneakers? <laughs> all of them. I don't have Yes, you can. I know it's copyrighted. Last one. At the beginning of the presentation, did you call our ethics free Autodesk search land outfits? <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, the color, not the logo. <laughs> cool. We have another question. Yeah, I know that early on in the process, you talked about that for safety, using it like caught on your run. Did you test it out running at all to see what it looked like out besides being trashed flash in the roll? If it was also safe? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have another question from Sai. How's the pattern coming along? Um, we're still in the filing process, but it, we're working on it. <laughs> cool. All right. Let's give them a round of applause. Okay. So you may have noticed there were a couple of themes that came up, like our battery died, or coding is hard, or, <laughs> or um, we had to iterate. And these were things that we wanted to expose, so now, now I'm talking to the inventors, we wanted to expose you to that so that if you decide, I want to be an engineer, or I want to study uh, environmental engineering, that you would have an idea of what you're going to get into before you get into it. And then also, you're also like super duper productive, where if there's a, an idea that you have, Instead of waiting for someone else to make it, like Apple or Microsoft, you can make it. And that's really powerful because we are moving toward a world where these devices, I mean, there are some people in this audience who are like me when I'm like, oh, I remember back in the day when I only had a wallet and keys in my pocket. Now it's wallet, keys, and phone. And we had no idea that our phone would be like our everything. Um, and so as we move toward more electronics, we're going to need more people um, like you all that have these experiences to be able to have agency in this world. And another theme came up, or a name came up, and it was Jerry. And Jerry is about to come up as well because, well, I'll, I'll just let Jerry, Jerry do his thing. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you for supporting your inventors. Thank you for bringing them here in all the ways that you have. Um, we want to make sure that um, the people who really also made this possible are known to you all. Uh, Jim Hook gave the introduction. Jim and I have been working on Invention Bootcamp for seven years now. Kavi Diaz, who is so and so important is actually at another educational event in Bend and normally she would be here. She is an incredible source of organization, inspiration, and just downright getting things done. Uh, but I also want, in addition to that, we've got the, the Massey College support staff, Helen Fry, Joyce Peretti, Brandy Cobb, <laughs> and others as well as faculty that have opened up their offices to us, uh, the people who make sure that machines are running, the, the melt, uh, the folks in the EPL who saved our bacon yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so all of these might not mean anything to you, but it's important to know that there is a big team here, a huge team that makes this possible. Uh, I want to especially call out the team of mentors who have helped us So Laura is one of the mentors who's going to help me. I would like the mentors to come up and tell us a, just a little bit about their team, because they have something. So uh, Kate? So well, we're working through our, uh, this is this called production. <laughs> <laughs> Next. So what would you think? So I mentored Aiden and Anna. Um, they were amazing. Uh, Anna is like 
one of the most kindest souls I've ever met. She came in every day with a big smile on her face and she's empathetic to everybody she meets. Uh, she taught me how to be more empathetic and to show that to people I don't know and people I do know and that was great. And Aiden, he, he comes in every day ready to take on a new challenge, which I think is amazing and nothing gets him down. I mean, even I messed up a few times and he was like ready to just keep moving and rolling and uh, that was great. So I'm so proud of you both and I wish you uh, a lot of luck in your future. Take them back. Are, uh, <laughs> cut, memorabilia. It could be a coaster. It could be a value. Uh, Kate is the uh, is the enthusiasm energy for the the, the whole boot camp. <laughs> she made sure we were clapping at every possible occasion that clapping would be appropriate, and sometimes even when it wasn't. So. <laughs> For my team, I'd like to really thank Jose because he actually missed a week of camp because he was sick and he was immediately come back and uh, just join the group and work every day really hard. So that was really nice. And David was like the leader of the team because he came up with the idea and he was always really vocal about how he wanted to create his vision and that was also super helpful. And then Tony, um, Tony. I had to sit next to him the whole time to make him work. Because <laughs> if I wasn't next to him, he was probably like looking up Eva stuff. So definitely the hardest to work with. Honestly. Yeah. Why don't you all come up? Come up. Come up. All right. <laughs> okay. Right. I was trying to get them to come up. And as you can tell, Gene is the one with the sly humor. I, I, it, all those, the, although this didn't happen, I kept <laughs> expecting Gene to just sort of quietly sidle up and say, Jerry, the 3D printer in the other room is burning. <laughs> <laughs> no, no drama, just <laughs> let me know the information. Need to call so, J J thanks, Gene. JTJ. Okay. <laughs> I think it'd be better if you can. Wait, you should have your team come up. Have them yeah. come up. Yeah, come up. Come up, come up, come up. <laughs> My team, obviously, is Tiny Junior. Tiny Timmy Junior the third, <laughs> right here. Um, they were amazing to work with. They're, um, they were friends really fast, really into the week. I knew that however much we wanted to split them up into two, they just wanted to stay together, and I think that was the best thing to do because they all work so well together. Every day was just something new, something to laugh at or something to argue about, but always laugh. <laughs> and it was an honor to, to be their mentor. And now they have a friend here, and I feel like I have four more new friends. Aww. Aww. Yeah, so Leslie um, is the the quiet, unassuming um, Arduino IDE ninja. <laughs> so that was the, couple, the first week, it was a little touch and go. I mean, we've been using these boards for years, literally, and of course, brand new computers. And she, she found the thing that had, had us totally stuck. So we're eternally grateful for your wisdom, your kindness, and also your Arduino ninja abilities. <laughs> Very good. Um, Hi, um, my name is Dahlia. I got to work with Oliver and Scarlett. Um, I, I wanted to work with them because I'm also a very forgetful person and I <laughs> thought their idea was amazing and working with them 
was so great getting to know Scarlett. She's so nice and funny and just fun to be around with. And Oliver, he's, he's so, I mean, they're both really smart. And um, working on their project, they just worked all the time. And it was just really great working with them. <laughs> Dahlia has a wonderful ability to draw out people. Occasionally at the first couple weeks, sometimes teams would be quiet and we weren't quite sure how we could inspire them. And, and then it would be, Dahlia would be like talking all the time. And I thought something about her personality, something about her warmth, something about her kindness always brought out the best in the team. So thank you, Dahlia. Casey! <laughs> uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Casey. I was able to mentor these two. Uh, I don't think they ever took a break. <laughs> they were constantly working, it was super impressive. I mean, for me at this age, this is definitely not what I was doing. You know, like, uh, you know they basically did what I recently did in my college course and you know, it was hard for me at 19 and 20, so for them to be able to do it in their teens is just awesome. And I couldn't thank them enough for staying on task and just working hard, and it was really awesome to see you guys grow throughout the camp. Good job, good job, good Casey, job. Casey, uh, as, as many mentors did, um, <laughs> right from the start I asked folks would you like to teach some of our sections? And so Casey taught our CAD class, and that would really was one of those moments where people like, you know, I'm used to teaching classes where people sort of lean back and they're like waiting for it to over, but when Casey's doing it, they're leaning forward and they're ready to go. He also always came up with a solution. So as he came over, he's like, ah, oh, something's not working. How about if we try this? So it was always a nice, not just giving me problems, but giving us solutions as well. So thank you for that. <laughs> so this is Team Hercules with their invention, or sorry, Team Armstrong with their invention, the Hercules. Um, funny story is that it began, or we started programming and running into a lot of logic-based issues. And as soon as we got that over that hurdle, I was not needed whatsoever. They just put their heads down, they got to it. Um, I'd like to thank Luis. Awesome leadership skills. Azaka, you're at times, your deadpan humor is really funny. <laughs> Hamadi, Zamper, just, you're, I, I'm like a whiteboard kind of person. When I got up there, they were not at all intimidated by the stuff I was just throwing at them. So that was great. You guys are really hardworking, and your product was amazing. gave a hint at, about what I was going to say, which is uh, he's a natural with a whiteboard marker at the whiteboard. <laughs> Just like uh, we had a visit from uh, the Lemelson Foundation folks here, and he was explaining some really deep code, and I was like, I, I had run off to another room, and I came back like, okay, go. It was his code. So, <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so as you guys on the very last team, I'm Jeev. I don't know why you guys call me like that, but <laughs> um, yeah, th honestly, like, risk rate, you guys were honestly amazing. Uh, I remember going into this 
uh, talking to you on week two about your wanting to do a high vis vest, and I thought that was really cool. And it's because I was always walking around on campus at, at night for no reason, but um, <laughs> um, but just seeing your guys's like process of doing things, I was really amazed at how e how quick you guys just led to doing your own things and how to make your amazing like, CAD. Connor just like solid on the fabrication side and sewing and the memes, of course, meme master. <laughs> and uh, really honestly, like you opened up a lot. I, I, I was like really like wanting to talk to you more, but like you just ended up talking to me more. I was like, cool, that's awesome. And yeah, solid, solid work on the coding. And it's been really cool to see how you guys have worked together. And like, I know I was also really good at like helping you with the cat part and that was like a struggle. And the fact that you got through it was amazing. So yeah, your invention is great, guys. Jeeve does double, triple duty. Uh, as you can see, he's got a camera over there. So in addition to helping this team and really, um, I think of all the mentors reminding us of the next step along their path. It was kind of like, well, when you get to next year in college, this is gonna happen. So he was always reminding folks of that path and carrying a camera around and doing double, triple duty all the time. So thank you for helping us remember. We have two more mentors that in the end weren't working directly with teams solely, but I wanted to make sure you all know about them. Laura Skinner, please. Woo! Woo! Laura, Laura brought incredible depth to the uh, discussion. She works as an RA in the dorms, and so we got tours of dorms. We got the real inside poop on life in... <laughs> in a dorm, as well as some amazing life stories that she, she shared with us early on about how she ended up, uh, her path along uh, the way to college. And that, that, I think, really set the tone, not only of uh, how, how your future can unfold, sometimes in unexpected ways, but how you can rise to that and uh, overcome. So thank you for that. And we have... Um, we're trying to think of the name for this, but the Uber over alumna <laughs> mentor Manasa. <laughs> Manasa was a, a mentor last year when we were online, and so she brought not only her great compassion and her understanding of the deeper connections of humanity into this engineering design process, but also the wisdom of what Mostly I probably forgot in the meantime, so uh, the ability to remind us gently of that was really great. And also to provide, as Mike who was also a prior mentor, um, this sort of generational uh, transfer of knowledge. So that was very good. So. Yes, if I didn't call out Mike too. So Mike was a mentor two and a, three years ago, back before pandemic time. Um, he's got an incredible skill at teaching and also um, keeping the, the, the community alive in, in so many ways. And it's easy to see the smile, right, and the <laughs> joyfulness, but there's another deep level that is so important. He has a concern for humanity and he will stop you from just going off doing technical stuff, he'll say, wait a minute, we have to pay attention to these other issues, these other concerns, like are the students even wanting to do this? I can forget about that a lot. And just, <laughs> just, just generally being a wonderful co-creator uh, co for the, the, the camp, so thanks so much. And I don't have a... <laughs> I, I don't have a... <laughs> I'll, I'll get you a bag of them. All right, let's go. Um, yeah, and also we got to thank Jerry as well because uh, I, I can't remember when it was, but uh, the, it was a recent term and I, I caught Jerry like in the hallway and I'm like, hey, I want to teach Invention Bootcamp. And then Jerry says, okay. And, <laughs> and then here I am. And um, this program has meant a lot to me, um, seeing the students like evolve from the, the week one form 
to the week four, <laughs> and then also seeing the mentors evolve and, and just seeing all of that is, is I love it, and that, that's all I gotta say. Um, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. A, card. <laughs> A little card. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Oh and my gosh. A little card for Jerry, too. Wow. Uh, Now I wish I had a seat. <laughs> I'll hold it. I so, uh, hold it? I, I can uh, hold it. I, yeah, I some of this have been, I mean, today you have seen the magic of Invention Boot Camp looking at, at what one instance of it does, what happens in four weeks. We've been doing this for seven years. Oh, okay. uh, this is the seventh Invention Boot Camp. And along the way, we've seen lots of different parts of the magic. Early on, we thought this was all for the inventors. And it is for the inventors and their families and, and for their futures. But we started noticing that the mentors we were recruiting were changing how they thought about engineering. They were changing how they thought about life. They were getting interested in education. And we weren't recruiting them for those talents. We were recruiting them because they took ME 120 and they survived it, you know. <laughs> uh, so we started really thinking of how we develop mentors. And you've seen now that our new instructor is a mentor alum. And Mike <laughs> is now a CS uh, instructor yes. and you know part of the faculty but he he started as a student here got recruited as a mentor and has gone through this process and has been an inspiration to many of us and and that's just been amazing to watch so thank you Mike <laughs> Jerry brought in this crazy course about, well, over a decade ago called Living with the Lab and transformed how we teach mechanical engineering, how we introduce engineering to all our students at, at Portland State. And it was that course that inspired Invention Boot Camp. Possibly, part, in part because David Coronado in the back was, was watching the students crash and burn and come and ask him for help. And he said, well, one way we could do this is by exposing them to some of the crazy aspects of inquiry-based learning while they're still in high school. And we could give them a leg up on college by bringing them in to this wildly unstructured environment, having them pick problems that they're interested in, and having them work on solving them. So this is, this is a pretty radical commitment to inquiry. Jerry brought that here, and Jerry has done that throughout his career. This year, Jerry retired. And this is Jerry's <laughs> last invention boot camp. So. I'm going to miss Jerry, you know. I've been... I'm going to miss Jerry. I, yeah. I'm not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, 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 Jerry. But Jerry, Jerry has done more to change how the Massey College welcomes new students and helps them find their identity as problem solvers, as engineers, and, and 
survive the rest of the boring classes they're subjected to that have too much theory in them and get out the far end and go into the field and actually practice. And what we have seen, what I've seen, I study all the data, is that the students who've gone through his class are more likely to stick it out through all the subsequent challenges that they're going to have in college than the students who've gone through more traditional kinds of instruction. Now, it's, it's hard, but those students persist and they persist in the discipline and one of the most important things we need to do as an engineering discipline is make the community of practicing engineers look like the community we serve because it hasn't, right? You've probably noticed that. This program is trying to do that. You know, this program is partnering with people who want to see engineering change, who want to see the people in our community practice engineering to improve their community. And that's, that's what this is all about. And Jerry has been a leader in that. And, and I just can't thank Jerry enough. The ethos of changing engineering and changing entrepreneurism and changing communities by bringing more people into it is the heart of the ethos of the Limbelson Foundation. And initially, uh, David Coronado helped us find the Limbelson Foundation, which he was working with as the director of Oregon Mesa. And then David Coronado is here as a representative of the Limbelson Foundation today as he's taken some of the ideas that he started here and taken them to an international scale uh, by working with the Limbelson Foundation. So we appreciate the, the continuous support of the Limbelson Foundation, of David, of Cindy Cooper, of Rob Schneider, Laura Locker, and, and just everybody who's been along for the entire the entire arc. This is this has really helped us change how we reach the community. And so thank you to the Limelson Foundation. One of the challenges of putting on this kind of a camp is getting the right people in the room. And Oregon Mesa and, um, uh, and an organization called Greater Than have been incredible partners in helping us find the right people and get them here. And we want to thank uh, Bianca at, at Oregon Mesa, Kelly Kuzno, uh, Tong Zhang, uh, and uh, uh, Aviva? Aviva? I'm. Okay. Okay, uh, Aviva Einhorn at Greater Than, and uh, uh, it's been a, a, an important partnership. It's kind of invisible at this stage, but it's one of the biggest challenges, actually. And so thank you to our partners for doing that. And we want to thank Autodesk for uh, hosting our visit. And then finally, the families. You know, takes a lot to support an inventor on a journey. Uh, there's success, there's failure, there's going to a scary place like downtown Portland. There's all these things, you know, we know they're all challenging and we appreciate your being here for the inventors and, and uh, we really appreciate everything that you've done. Uh, and I just, you know, I wanna thank everybody again uh, we, we've thanked Kavi in Abstentia. Uh, she has already been at my next event, uh, which is focused on, on uh, computer science education. Uh, and uh, she wishes she could be here. Uh, but I want to thank you all, and I really encourage you to spend more time getting to see the magic that's happened in these past four weeks by interacting with our inventors. And please, have a gr wonderful rest of the day. So thank you. Thank you.